Hi, I'm Ray, back with a, another Sunday episode. Thanks for all your messages uh, and emails. Talking of messages, do you remember last week's uh, Wednesday's midweek message that I did? I was telling you about this Sunday's episode, which is about twins, uh, twin girls, twin boys, identical twins. And quite a few of you have contacted me. Uh, we'll start with Alison. I'm not going to go through a load of emails, don't worry. Start with Alison. She's uh, got a twin sister. And she said, uh, thinking back to primary school, uh, they're about eight or nine, she says. The teacher made them put labels on. They had to stick, you know, sellotape labels to their cardigans in class because the teacher couldn't tell the difference. They were identical twins. And of course, what they did, they swapped places. They sat side by side. They swapped places and swapped labels. So, <laughs> so of course, the teacher never knew which was which. It must have been quite hilarious. I would imagine a lot of identical twins do that or did that sort of thing. She said the thing was when they got older at secondary school, uh, what, where is it? Oh, yes, they were 14. She says uh, the headmaster came out and he said, he said to her, Oi, I saw you smoking round by the bike sheds. I was looking out my office window. I saw you. And she said, well, it wasn't me. Oh, yes, it was. He said, no, 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 it wasn't me. And he said, don't start saying it was your sister because <laughs> she's not around. Um, I don't know where her sister was. But she got blamed for that. And it was actually her sister. And she said that all through their teenage years, uh, Alice had got blamed for all her, she hasn't mentioned her sister's name, but for all her, her sister's misdemeanours, she got blamed for it. I mean, they were good friends. She said they never fell out over it. Uh, what you don't say, Alison, is did you ever have fun with boyfriends? When you think of the fun you could have, twin sisters, each with a boyfriend, twin brothers with a girlfriend each, you know, swapping around. I mean, the I don't know, it's endless, isn't it? The fun and games you could have. Now, now my story begins in a fish and chip shop, would you believe? Yeah, it was fun looking back. It was fun. It was, I was going to say tragic. It wasn't tragic. It was, I was very annoyed at one stage. I was disappointed. Well, I'll tell you about it. I met Molly in a fish and chip shop. What a place to meet a girl. How about that? Not a pub or a club or a disco or these days, isn't it, online dating. It was down the local fish and chip shop where I was buying my cod and chips. I, there's only two of us in there and uh, we got served by different people at the same time. We walked outside and it was a summer evening and I just said more or less, not so much to her, but I don't know, I was thinking aloud. I just said, oh, I think I'll go over the park and eat this. And she said, oh, OK, mind if I join you? So we went to the park and we sat on the park bench eating our fish and chips. We both had cod and chips and it was great. I, do you know, I can't remember. Was it in newspaper? I'm going back to the oh, fish, fish and chips. Fish and chips were in newspaper in the 50s. I remember that as a kid. This was late 60s, early 70s. I I'd got an idea they'd sort of banned second ad old newspapers by then because because you know people at home reading through the paper uh scratching themselves you know, picking their nose or whatever as they flick through the paper then they give it to the fish and chip shop and they serve food in it so fair enough i suppose <laughs> but it was great eating fish and chips in newspaper because you could read the paper yeah, whatever it was, the news articles or adverts, you could read the paper while you're eating your, your chips. Anyway, that's all beside the point. So we actually got together after the fish and chips. We'd finished that. And I said, do you fancy a drink? Because there's a pub just down there, my local pub. We both lived locally. And she said, yeah, OK, yeah, why not? So we walked to the pub and that's how we started going out with each other. She was a lovely girl, uh, Blonde hair, I can't remember exactly. Had quite long blonde hair. She was slim. You, know, I won't go, you don't need to know all that, do you? You do want to know all that, okay? <laughs> yeah, she was long blonde hair, slim. She was what age was she? Goodness me, I can't remember. She must have been eighteen. I must have been about twenty, right? Yeah, so that's the ages sorted out. So we're in the pub having a chat, and uh, she told me where she worked in an office and just general chatting. At the end of the evening, um, I I didn't walk her home because she. Although we both live locally, she was one direction and I was the other. And it was a summer evening. It was about 10 o'clock. It really wasn't dark or not quite. So she said, no, 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 it's all right. And we arranged to meet in the pub again the following day. 
Now this, I believe this was a Friday night because I didn't have work the next day. So I arranged to meet her on the, the following day, the Saturday night in the pub. We had a, a great evening. Uh, we got on really well together. And we both were, were saying, oh, you know, fancy bumping into each other in the chippy. What a, a result sort of thing. We were both pleased to have met each other. And I, I must admit, I was thinking, you know, she's probably one of the nicest girls I'd met so far. Well, I didn't know her that well, but I had known some awful girls. Well, we'll save that for another time. I'll do an awful girlfriend uh, podcast episode, shall I? <laughs> but not now. I had been going out with Molly for a couple of weeks when we decided to go and see a live band. Now, that wasn't in the local pub. That was a pub about a mile or two away. So she gave me her address. I said, I'll pick you up tomorrow night, seven o'clock. So I drove round there, rang on the doorbell. She opened the door and I just said, hi. And she looked at me, sort of blank, and said, can I help you? I said, uh, yes, I've come to pick you up. We're going to the, the live mu uh, music, the band. Oh, sorry, she said, sorry, you want my sister. At that moment, Molly appeared behind this girl. She said, sorry, Ray, come in. This is my twin sister, Sally. And I'm thinking, I cannot tell the difference. I'm looking at these two. And I said, I can't tell the difference between you two. And Sally said, we're identical twins. You won't tell the difference. There is no difference. All went into the lounge and we're chatting. And I was amazed. I, I already knew a couple of twin uh, boys. They sometimes went into the local pub. And whenever I saw one of them, I'd say, hello, John. And he'd say, I'm Dave. Oh, OK. Sorry, Dave. Another time I go, hello, Dave. All right. I'm John. Oh, I think they did it deliberately. I, I could never work out the difference between those two lads. Even when they stood there together, I remember looking at them. There was no difference. I just couldn't work it out. No one could. And I reckon also, if anyone did get it right, they said they were wrong anyway. <laughs> it must be great fun being identical twins. I would imagine, though, at the same time, it can probably be a nightmare. About a week later, I was round Molly's again to pick her up. And I didn't know who answered the door. I just said, hello. I <laughs> didn't know which girl it was. Um, oh, by the way, her, her mum, they both live with their mum. The dad worked abroad somewhere, so I didn't see him. So uh, yeah, we're going in the lounge again, I'm, and her mum is rabbiting to me about something or other. And I'm looking at the two girls standing side by side, trying to see whether there was any distinguishing mark or anything that would help me tell them apart. And I happened to see on one of their, the back of their hand was a very small mole, and that was Molly. So I thought, that's it. I've, I've got it. I've done it. Molly Mole. That's the way to remember it. Molly Mole. So I didn't say anything. I didn't tell them that. I just, I thought I'd be clever and, and just say, you know, hello, Sally and hello, Molly, to the right girl rather than just make a total mess of it as I had been doing. So we went out and it was about, uh, I don't know, what was it? We'd been out three or four times. About a week later, we'd arranged to meet in the pub and I got there first. She came in. I'd already got her drink. And I was sitting at a table. She joined me and we started to chat. And I noticed as she held her glass up to take a drink, I noticed there was no mole on the back of her hand. So my immediate thought was, I've got this mixed up. I've, it's wrong. It's not Molly Mole. It's Sally Mole. Sally's got the mole. No, it hasn't. No. And then I'm confused. And then I realised, no, I'm not confused at all. Molly Mole. This is not Molly. I was sitting there having a drink with Sally. Now, at this stage of the story, you're probably completely, totally and utterly confused, as I had been previously, but I wasn't confused this time. I was sitting there with Sally. I realised that, obviously, they were going to have a, a bit of a laugh, a bit of a... They're tricking me. They wanted to see whether I could tell the difference, see whether they could get away with it. I half expected Molly to walk in at any moment and say, ah, oh, you see, that fooled you, didn't it? But she didn't. She didn't turn up. And Sally didn't say, you know... There we are, you fell for it. You can't tell the difference. She just sat with me for the evening. We got there at, what, seven? We left there about 11, so we were four hours together. And I didn't walk her home again. She said, oh, it's OK, I'll walk myself home. I thought, I'm not going to let on at all that I know it's Sally. So as I was saying goodbye, I pulled her close and kissed her quite passionately. And she returned the kiss quite passionately. So we said goodnight and off she went. As I walked home, I was 
thinking out how far are they going to take this this game? When are they going to tell? You know, are they going to do this again? Is Sally going to turn up in Molly's place again? What's going to happen? How far will they go? I was quite intrigued at that stage, but it was just a game. I thought, you know, that's that's fair enough. You know, they're having a bit of a laugh, twin sisters. Why not? So I joined in. I, I thought I'm not going to spoil the game by saying, look, I know the difference. I thought I'd just leave it and see what happened. About a week later, I'd arranged to meet Molly, not in the pub this time, it was in a, a place down the road. There was a, a small club and we'd arranged to meet outside and then we were going to go into the club together. It was, a, I suppose it was a nightclub. It was more of a pub with a kind of back room uh, disco thing. So disco thing, you're thinking, what on earth is a disco thing? I don't know, a kind of dance floor. It was known as a club. And uh, you you didn't have to be a member. You could just go in. They would vet you. They'd look you up and down. And they obviously looked me up and down. I thought, oh, extremely good looking young man. Yes, you can come in. <laughs> I don't know why they let me in, but they did. So Sally turned up and we went into the club. I got the drinks. We sat at a table in the, the club section out the back. And she said, oh, shall we dance? We danced. Let me rephrase that. She danced. I made moves. What is it people say? Um threw some shapes on the floor or something. I, d I don't dance, I just sort of wobbled about. So I jigged and wobbled about and we had a dance and, you know, we got on really well and I was beginning to worry. Now, you know what I'm worrying about, don't you? Again, how far is this going to go? What are the girls going to do? How far are they going to take it? I can't remember exactly, but for about a month, uh, yeah, it must have been four or five weeks, Sally didn't turn up. It was always Molly. So I thought the game was over. That was it. They obviously decided to end it before things did go too far. That would have been interesting. <laughs> Molly and I had had a great evening watching a live band and we'd walk back to my place. We had a couple of drinks and we put some music on and you know, we were chatting. And in the end, I said, look, you might as well stay the night rather than walk home. And she agreed. And it was it was nice to have her there. It was great. And over the next two or three weeks, she stayed a couple more times. Only at the weekends, you know, when we'd been out, it was getting a bit late. Walk back to my place, have a couple of extra drinks, listen to some music, and then she'd stay the night. That was great. We were getting on really well, and I was pleased that at last I found, I found someone that possibly I'd have a long-term future with. Some time later, or well, say a week later, I'd arranged to meet Molly in the pub, and Sally turned up. Now, this was going to be interesting because I was, Molly and I had arranged to go and see this live band. This time we were going to walk because they were at a closer pub. We were going to walk to this other pub to see the live band. They were very good. I forget what they were called, but they played a lot of the 60s and 70s. Yeah, it must have been 70s because I'm sure they played 70s music. Anyway, they were really good. They did the Beatles, they did the Stones, Animals. Do you remember all that lot? Do you remember the pretty things? <laughs> Back in those days, the boys did look pretty, didn't they? I mean, fancy calling your band, you know, the pretty things. I don't know. Anyway, we walked to this other pub and we watched the band and uh, we had a great evening. So I said, back to my place as usual. And she said, yes, OK. So now I'm thinking, really, what is going to go on here? We got back to my place, gave her a drink. We sat down, I put some music on. And I thought, look, she's going to end this any minute now. She's going to end this. We both had a few drinks, I suppose, too many, because I wasn't sure what to do. Uh, she was in no state to walk home. And I, in the end, I said, look, do you want to stay on the sofa? And she said, oh, OK, I'll stay on the sofa. So she went to the bathroom and got ready, blah, blah, blah. What's blah, blah, blah mean? It means there's a load of stuff that you're not really interested in. Anyway, we ended up in the bedroom. <laughs> and I can't go into that because um, we might have younger listeners. We might have older listeners that, that are getting uh, excited. The following morning, she got up and she left straight away. She said, oh, well, I must go. I I've got to go to work. Well, there wasn't work. It was Saturday and she didn't work Saturday. I forget what her job was. Um, yeah, what was she, 18? I think she only just left college or something. Anyway, she didn't work the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays she was off. So that was obviously an excuse or a reason or whatever to run off, to run off home and think, oh my God, what have I done? I better explain here that you'll be thinking, well, why didn't, when Sally turned up, what, did, what was Molly doing? 
if she thought she was going out, you know, Molly thought she was going out with me, what was she doing? Because obviously Sally turned up in her place. Were they still playing the game? Or now was Sally seeing me kind of on the side, uh, which I thought as she stayed the night, she must have, she obviously hadn't told Molly that. She wouldn't tell her that. So perhaps she was sneaking off out with me. I don't know. I don't know how they'd worked it. At that stage, I hadn't got a clue what they were doing. I really couldn't see that Molly would have said to Sally, OK, well, you go out with him, then you stay the night at his place. I just didn't think that at that point that that's what they were doing. After a couple of months had gone by, I'd been going out with Molly, and on the odd occasion, Sally would turn up, take her place, stay at my house. I began to think that this was no longer a game. I reckon that when I phoned Molly or when Molly phoned me, perhaps it was Sally phoning me and saying, let's go out tomorrow night. Sally obviously knew when Molly was going out to meet me. Perhaps she knew the night that Molly wasn't seeing me. So she'd ring me and say that she was Molly and shall we meet? I also reckon that at some point they probably thought that I would say, look, I know what's going on. I sussed this out. I can see what you're doing. They probably thought at some point earlier in the game that that's what I would do. I'd realised what was going on, but I hadn't. So I don't know. I, at that time, I was just trying to work out the possibilities. Did Molly know that Sally was seeing me? Were they still playing the game? If so, why? And if they were still doing that, then I was disappointed. I remember feeling quite angry at one stage when Sally turned up because I'd been hoping to have some sort of future with Molly. I don't mean marriage and stuff, but well, possibly that even one day, possibly. But when Sally turned up, every time she turned up, which wasn't that often, but I thought, oh, yeah, I would just wish this would stop. And I knew that I had to say something. I knew I had to go around to the, the girl's house and confront them both and say, look, you know, what the hell is going on here? As I thought about it, as I thought about confronting them both, I realised that I was the innocent, well, I wasn't. Oh, I was far from innocent because I knew exactly what was going on. I knew who Sally was and I knew who Molly was. But as far as the girls were concerned, I was innocent. I was the innocent party. I was going out with Molly. So I thought, well, I'm going to stick to that. <laughs> Whatever I do, I'm going to stick to my story. That's it. I'm innocent. I thought I was going out with Molly. So when I did go to their house, I didn't confront them. But I did come out with a couple of lines that I thought might give me a clue as to whether they knew that I knew or, or whatever. I just said to them both, that uh, that band was good the other night. Molly said, yeah, it was, it was great. Well, it was Sally that I'd taken to the band. So I was totally confused. I expected Molly to say, what band? When was that? But she didn't. Molly said, yeah, it was great. At that stage, I thought they're still in this together. And I was really disappointed then. I was getting quite angry because I thought they're still playing this game I, I can't have two girlfriends. I, it wasn't in me to, well, normally, I wouldn't two-time anyone. I suppose I can't really say that because I'd been two-timing the sisters uh, with each other and I knew it. So I wasn't, <laughs> I was far from innocent. But I didn't know what to do. In fact, I decided that evening I went out with Molly. We had a couple of drinks. She came back to my place and she stayed the night. And I had decided then to end it with both of them, just finish the whole thing. Because I don't know how long we've been going out, three months or more, and this had been going on all the time, and I had decided to end it. The next time I'd arranged to see Molly, we were going to go on to see a band, and we'd arranged to meet in the pub. Sally turned up, and I thought, OK, this will be the evening when I tell them, that's it, it's all over. The funny thing is, I was sitting there with Sally having a, a beer, and Molly walked in. She came stomping over to our table, looked at me and said, what the hell are you up to? <laughs> and I just, I, I looked innocent. Well, I was good at looking innocent, although guilty. Innocent until proved guilty, is it, or something? Anyway, I said, what do you mean? What, what do you want? What are you doing here, Sally? She said, I'm Molly. I did an absolutely brilliant act. I should be on the stage. I was brilliant. She said, I'm Molly. And you know it. I said, what? Uh, sorry? What? I looked at Sally sitting opposite me and I said, what's Sally on about? <laughs> I played the part so well. So then Molly, who walked in and caught us together, started having a go at Sally. What's your game? What are you up to? 
because there was a bit of a scene happening. And I said, look, 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 shh, sit down. Let's all have a drink and talk about this. It turned out that devious young Sally had been seeing me on the odd evening that I'd not seen Molly. If you're confused now, I don't blame you at all. So am I. I have to keep stopping and thinking, where am I in this story? What's going on? I can't remember. Who's who? <laughs> I would have been better off going out with their mum. At, le at least I could tell the difference. No, 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 seriously. So what was happening was, on the nights I didn't see Molly, Sally knew about this and she'd phone me, she'd meet in the pub. Or if I phoned and Sally happened to answer, she would say, oh, let's meet in the pub. I'm very surprised, actually, that, it didn't all go wrong for them, for Sally, because meeting me in the pub on the nights that I wasn't seeing Molly, I mean, it could easily have gone wrong. It could have clashed. Of course, you have to remember that these were the days before mobile phones. So Molly couldn't phone me and say, well, where are you? I didn't have a, an answer machine at home. Had she phoned me at home and I was out, she, you know, she couldn't leave a message because that would have really put the cat amongst the pigeons because she would say, didn't you get my phone message? And I'd have to say no. <laughs> anyway, the whole thing, it was really risky on Sally's part, but she got away with it for a long time. She got away with it. But of course, now there was big trouble. Thinking back, she only got away with it because I was complicit in the uh, treachery or uh, adultery or whatever, you the skullduggery, the uh, debauchery or whatever name you want to put on it. I was complicit, wasn't I? Because I knew exactly what was going on. I knew who was spending the night at my place. Um, so I was, yes, I was guilty. But of course, they didn't know that. And I had to stick to that. I had to, it's a little white lie. White lies are okay, aren't they? Yeah, of course they are. Have you ever told a white, have you ever told a big, a big, not white lie? I can't say a black lie. Can I, are you allowed to say that? Oh, here we go. I'm thinking about political correctness again. Black lie? Can I? No, I don't know. Have you ever said anything in the way of a bigger lie? <laughs> I don't know. All this PC stuff makes me laugh. Well, as someone said the other day, if you don't laugh, it make, it'll make you cry. So the situation was now, the three of us are sitting in the pub. Molly, I got Molly a drink. We all had drink. We're sitting there in this corner table and there's this argument going on between the girls. I was disappointed. I, every time I looked over at Molly, I could see in her eyes that she was really upset. And I felt guilty. I felt angry at Sally. I felt disappointed. I felt guilty because I was complicit in the whole thing. It was, a, a, it was an awful evening, to be honest. Molly, understandably, wanted answers. And she said to me, right, we've been going out. For, I can't remember the numbers. We've been going out for so many weeks together. How many times have I stayed at your place all night? So I said, well, I don't know. I, I can't remember. I haven't counted. And she was counting for me. She said, uh, we went to see this band and that band. She had her little diary. Again, no mobile phone where you've got your calendar on there and things. She got this little diary out of her bag. And she said, we went to see the band then. I stayed at your place, blah, blah, blah. And she said, how many times have I stayed at your place? I thought back and I said... It must be something like 11 or 12, 11 or 12 times. And she said, well, in actual fact, it's eight. She said, so Sally obviously stayed the other four times. And Sally started to say, oh, I didn't stay. Molly said, shut up. <laughs> that was that. I, I was, remember, I was innocent. So I said, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how many times. Between you, you've stayed at my place about 12 times. That's all I can say. Of course, Molly was up. Oh, dear, she was upset. Sally walked off in the end. She said, oh, I'm not doing this, and went and left Molly with me. As I said, I, I felt annoyed, guilty, a mixture of annoyance, guilt, disappointment. I was annoyed with Sally. To be honest, I was annoyed with myself. I should never have gone along with it. I, you know, mucking Molly around like this. But as I pointed out to Molly, I said, look, you two started this as a game, didn't you? And she admitted. She said, yes, we did. She said, but I didn't expect it to go this far. I said, well, why didn't you end the game? I said, really? I'm the one. I'm the one that's aggrieved, not you. I said, you two have played this game with me. Sally's lied to me, making out she's you. 
I'm the innocent party here. I mean, I felt even more guilty after saying all that because I now made Molly feel guilty. When, well, she was guilty. She shouldn't have played the game. Anyway, I suppose you want to know what happened long term. I don't know. Molly and I went out together for the next couple of weeks or so and then we drifted apart. And that was that. It couldn't work after that. She kept questioning me. Yeah, what was Sally like when she stayed at your house? What was it like with her? And I knew she would never let go. She would never let go of that. So we just split up, which was a great shame. Just made myself a cup of tea. Not that you're interested, but I thought I'd let you know. Now, I've got an email here from John. John has a twin brother, identical twins. And he's, <laughs> he's I don't know why I'm laughing. It's awful, really. He said many decades ago, many years ago, his brother went out with this girl. He'd only been out with her a couple of times. And for a laugh, John took his place. He took his brother's place. A bit like Molly and Sally. And John <laughs> went out with this girl for a couple of times uh, in, in his brother's place. And he said they both felt really guilty. He reckons that you know, people would think, oh, that's great fun. You know, what a laugh that is. But he said it wasn't a laugh at all. He said they both felt really guilty. And uh, one of them, I think the brother, I can't remember what the email said now, one of them packed up the girl, said, that's it, you know, we're finished sort of thing, made up some excuse. <laughs> so they didn't see her again. But uh, she never knew. But they both felt really bad about it. And I suppose, John, th this is what I felt with Molly and Sally. I knew, I knew almost from day one when I saw the mole, Molly Mole. That was the way I knew which was which, Molly Mole. So I know, I do know about your guilt, how you must have felt at the time. I've got another email here from Emma. Hello, Emma, if you're listening. Emma says she went out with a twin, a twin a brother, and uh, this chap was lovely and they were going to get married and everything. And one night, unbeknown to her, again, they were identical twins, unbeknown to her, one evening, this chap's brother turned up. Um, they were going out somewhere, I don't know where they were going out, and this brother turned up and she knew, she knew that it was the brother, the twin brother, because she was able to tell somehow, doesn't say in the email. And she said that she went along with it. She thought, right, this will be some fun. You know, a bit like I did. Let's see how far this is going to go. She thought this should be fun. And this brother went back to her place with her. Um, apparently, I think she said something about her place was near to where they were. And they always went back to hers rather than his because it was a lot nearer. So she took the brother back to her place, as she normally did with her boyfriend, his twin brother. This is confusing, isn't it? Do you know, I'm so glad I'm not a twin. I, oh, dear. Can you imagine what I would have done had I been a twin? Oh, no, don't. Don't even go there. So she took the brother of her boyfriend back to her place and he spent the night there. And she, she knew who it was. She knew very well who it was. But she played the Little Miss Innocent like I played Little Mr Innocent. And she said her boyfriend didn't know. So the, this brother had obviously thought he'd try it on and see how far he could get. Now her boyfriend knew nothing about it, so she did it again. And she did it again and again. And the thing is, she got married to the original, <laughs> to the original boyfriend. She got married and she still saw the twin brother on the odd occasion. So I really don't know. Uh, that, that's a complicated one. I mean, that's, that's naughty, isn't it? She does say that she felt guilty all along, but well, I can't read the whole email out because it's a bit, um, gets a bit intimate. But she said that they both had different things to offer, put it that way. The, her husband had uh, a good job and he had money and the rest of it. And his brother, her sort of boyfriend on the side, uh, he had other things to offer. So there we are. Well, in that one. <laughs> well, in that one there, Emma, thank you very much for your email. That was a very interesting one, as was Alison's, which I started off with earlier. I remember a couple of girls at my primary school, Dawn and Diana, I think. Dawn and Diana, that was it. They were twins. They weren't identical. You could tell the difference, but to, you had to sort of look for the differences to really know. And they used to try to muck about with the teacher. The teacher would say to one of them, did you do that? No, my sister did it. And the sister would say, I didn't do it. It was my sister. And of course, the teacher would give up in the end because I remember all us kids laughing. I mean, I, I knew which was which, but I think that, oh, that's what it, it was a new teacher 
if I remember rightly, do we have uh, in those days supply, what are they called, supply teachers? Oh, I don't know what they were, stand-in people. Anyway, it was a new teacher and she, <laughs> she didn't know these two. Dawn and Diana, I do know their surname, but I won't mention that. Dawn and Diana, good grief, going back to the 50s, that is. But I do, one of them knocked the fire extinguisher off the wall. She was mucking about and she knocked this fire extinguisher off and it's the foam type and the thing went off on the floor. So, they, of course, we're all shrieking with laughter. This thing's on the floor, spraying foam, all of this white foam all over the plate, the ceiling, the walls, everywhere. Now, who did it? I think, I forget who did it. Was it Dawn or, I don't know, well, say Dawn did it. And Diana got the blame. <laughs> and the parents came up to the school. And they, they, I don't know whether they got to the bottom of it or not, but I know there was a lot of trouble about it. That, in the end, they put the two girls in different classes. They just put them in different classes because, I mean, they shouldn't have done that because one, I think they one was um, a little bit more academic than the other, so they put her in a higher class and they split them up that way because it was just a nightmare for all the teachers. And we just thought it was hilarious, of course. Dawn and Diana, I bet they had some fun when they reached their teens, when they were older with boyfriends. Goodness me. Had I had a identical twin brother, I don't know what we'd have done. We'd have probably got into all sorts of trouble. Good grief. We'd be saying, stone the crows all the time. I don't know, stone the crows. Got an email here from Rob. Now, Rob, are you serious? Is this real? Have you made this up? I mean, come on. Rob married a girl, OK? And his brother, Steve, married the girl's twin sister. So they both married identical twins. Rob says... <laughs> is this true? I mean, OK, let, we'll let people decide. So Rob and his uh, brother married these identical twins, had one each. And after three years, they swapped over. They swapped sisters. He said it was all very uh, amicable. It was discussed. They talked about it and they decided to swap wives. So Rob and his brother swapped sisters. He doesn't go into a great deal of detail about why, I don't know. Presumably they were having an affair or something, or I don't know what was going on there, Rob. I mean, you know, come on, if you're listening, uh, email me again. You didn't reply when I asked you whether it was true. You haven't answered that email that I sent you back. So come on, Rob, own up. Was that true? Rob and his brother married twin sisters, and then after whatever it was, years, swapped wives. Okay. Well, we'll leave that one there, Rob. If you do email me, I yeah, do, because I can put people right perhaps next Sunday, if you can let me know. I can tell them whether that was true or not. Mind you, if you say it was true, you're probably lying. So there we are, identical twins. Uh, quite interesting. The thing is with Molly and Sally, physically, apart from that little mole that Molly had on her hand, physically, they were identical. I suppose, hence the term identical twins. They really were 110% identical. But the funny thing is their characters were identical as well. Their taste in music, the drinks they liked, the clothes they liked, everything about them, they sounded the same. You couldn't tell the difference even from their voices. It was quite, it's uncanny really, isn't it? It's like one person, I don't know, one person with two bodies, you know what I mean? It's like one person, whichever one you meet, it's the same person. They look the same. They sound the same. They are the same. It's quite weird, isn't it, really? Anyway, any more identical twins out there listening to me, do email me. I'd love to hear your story. I've got some more emails here, but they're all. I'm not going to read them all out because they're all more or less on the same lines, playing around with the teacher at school. Uh, oh, there's one I, I do want to read out from, uh, where is it, from Tansy. Hello, Tansy. It's a lovely name. She says that uh, she's an identical twin and she said that her and her sister went for... No, her, she, sorry, we, she went for a job at uh, an office and she got the job and she, the first day she was there, she didn't like it. She didn't like the job at all. And she thought, well, I'm not staying here. I don't know what it was about it, but she didn't like the job. So the second day, her twin sister went along and took her place. Now, of course, no one knew... And as it was only a second day that the boss and the other people, she was new, she didn't know her way around the office. And her sister ended up staying at the job 
I don't know what happened then with, I suppose, yeah, the surname is the same, isn't it? The address would be the same. That's interesting. What about the national insurance number, though, Tansy? What about that for for payment? Goodness knows. She doesn't say much more. We'd like to hear more about that one, Tansy, if you're listening. Tell me what happened to, I mean, your national health number. You know, one of you goes to the doctor or, you know, what happens when you go to the doctor? And he says, oh, you know, you've got a, a bit of a cough, have some tablets or what, cough mixture. And then the other one, I don't know. I don't, I mean, how far do you take it? You, you've heard of identity theft these days. Well, I suppose you could, you could do identity theft. You could nick your identity. Oh, I don't know, your sister's identity. I think we'll end this twin thing here because I'm going to get hugely confused, which, as you know, is very easy anyway at the best of times. Hang on, hang on. Just before we do end it, identical twins... Do they have the same fingerprints? No, they wouldn't, would they? No, no, no. Surely not, they can't. Imagine that. <laughs> one commits a crime and the other one goes to prison for the crime. Oh, no, that can't be the case, can it? There are mirror twins, aren't there? Yes, I've heard of that, mirror twins. So one's right-handed and one's left-handed. I think also they can have organs swapped over. One's heart is on the right or whatever, and one's on the left. No, no, I'm getting too involved now. As I said, I think we ought to end it. But I'm pretty sure there are mirror twins. I'll have to look into that out of interest. When I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, wondering why I'm not asleep, I'll get my iPad <laughs> and I shall look up mirror twins and learn all about it. And when I've learned all about it, I can do another entire podcast episode all about twins and bore you even further. No, seriously, do you wake up in the morning, like three in the morning, two in the morning? I do. It's awful. Not all the time, but I have dreams. Weird and wonderful dreams. I think there's something wrong with my brain, to be honest. Weird dreams. And I wake up, say, two in the morning, and I can't go back to sleep. And I look at the clock, quarter past two, half past two, you know, eventually three o'clock, four o'clock, and I cannot go back to sleep. And I do, I grab my iPad sit up in bed and just <laughs> start looking around the internet. I might have a couple of emails to answer, perhaps podcast emails or whatever, and uh, I'll have a look at the news, see what's going on on Twitter, and eventually, if I'm lucky, I might go back to sleep. But of course, the trouble is then, the following day, I'm tired all day, and I might have to have a sleep in the afternoon or around about lunchtime. And I just feel dreadful. But you can't go back to sleep. Who is it? Someone said to me, or oh, if you wake up and you start thinking, you know, your, your thoughts are whirring round in your mind, just stop thinking about everything. Clear your mind, blank mind and go to sleep. Well, I wish it was that easy. I said, how can I do that? You can't. You can't stop thinking. Have you ever tried to think of nothing? Don't have any thoughts. You can't. It's impossible. At night when you're awake, all sorts of things. I must do this tomorrow. Oh, I must do that tomorrow. Oh, I never did email that chap. Oh, yeah, I've got to do that. To the, I must do that to the car. Yeah, I, I mustn't forget that. I meant to do that last week and still haven't done it. And it goes on and on like that until, well, until the sun comes up. <laughs> Talking to the sun. Where are I? What's the date? I don't know what the date is. Sunday, isn't it? Uh, 21st is the shortest day. So whenever the 21st is... Uh, after that, evenings start getting lighter. Now, that's difficult to believe, isn't it? Because January and February, it just seems to get darker and darker, colder, wetter, windier, awfuler, and more horrid. Don't you love that word, horrid? Kids say that, don't they? Oh, when I was a kid, I remember that. People saying, other kids saying, horrid, oh, you're horrid. <laughs> I remember at kindergarten, there was this girl. I was about three or four years old, you know, and I can remember... I pulled her hair. She would stamp her foot and say, Stobbage, Stobbage. So I'd pull her hair again, Stobbage, and stamp her foot. <laughs> I wonder where she is now. I wonder whether she remembers that. Yeah, she might be saying to her kids, oh, there was this horrible boy I knew at kindergarten. He used to pull my hair. I often, you know, do you think that? I often think back to when I was very young with other kids at school. Do they remember me? Because I remember them. You know, I can remember kids at school when I was five, six years old. Do they remember me? I wonder. That's interesting, isn't it? The funny thing is, the older I've got, uh, I should say the older I've become, really. 
speak properly in it <laughs> or what. No, the older I've become, the more I, I think back to my teens and the girlfriends I had. Do they, I, I sometimes think back and I, I recall them and what we did together and the places we went. Do they recall me like that? Do they think back, oh, oh I remember that Ray bloke with that car he had taking me up the downs or over to the woods. Do they remember me? Do they think back? That's interesting, isn't it? Because very often, well, not very often, I suppose, but I do sometimes think, oh, I remember her. Yeah, that's a long time. I haven't seen her since I was sort of 18, <laughs> which is like 100 years ago. And yet I remember. I remember going places with whoever it was, going out with things we did together. I wonder whether they think back and remember that dreadful bloke Ray. <laughs> That's probably best that I don't know, actually. Talking of thinking back to your early days, someone said to me recently, you know, now I'm 70, someone said, do you feel 70? And I said, no, I don't feel 70 at all. In fact, in my mind, I feel 18, 20, 20 years old. It's only when I come to do something physically, you know, like uh, lift something or... <laughs> or whatever, move something heavy, that I realised, no, I'm not 20 years old anymore. I can't do it. But the strange thing is, someone said the other day about older people, some older men, think they look really good. They think they look sexy and good looking. In their mind's eye, they are. They think, well, look at me, you know. I used to be uh, you know, a man about town, uh, one of the lads, <laughs> and I still am. And they eye up younger women, you know, and of course the younger women, they must look at the older blokes and think, good grief, what's he looking at me like that for? What's he thinking, dirty old man? But the thing is, being an older man, I, I think in your mind, you know what I'm trying to say, I'm not putting it across very well, am I? You know, in your mind, you're thinking, well, I'm pretty good, actually, for my age, I'm pretty good looking, I'm fun to be with. <laughs> Imagine on these dating sites, you know, a bloke of my age, 70 years old, and he thinks, oh, I better put on 40 or maybe 50, and comes across as young. He can chat on the phone, coming across as perhaps 40 or 50. That's all right, until, until the person meets you. <laughs> You're not 40 or 50. You look more like 100. <laughs> it's a funny old thing, getting older. I remember looking at old boys when I was in my teens and thinking, well, what do they know? You know, they don't know anything. And, of course, that's the way youngsters... Look at older people like me. You know, older people, we know nothing about uh, love and relationships and sex. We haven't got a clue. You know, well, where do they think they came from? <laughs> you know, we've been, I tell you what, us older people, uh, more than hot dinners. <laughs> I better be careful what I say now, especially as I've got neighbours listening to me. I mentioned that, didn't I, in the midweek message. Neighbours listening to me. So I better not say that I've got awful neighbours. They're dreadful. Honestly, the people around here are dreadful. <laughs> no, they're not. They're lovely. They're really lovely. But they do, though, the youngsters, teenagers. I mean, not all of them. I know I've got teenagers that listen to this regularly. But uh, a, a lot of them, OK, some of them, do think that older people haven't lived. You know, their parents, their parents haven't had sex. Their parents haven't been in love. Good grief, they know nothing about anything. They just don't know anything. And, of course, the parents have, well, they've done it all. Seen it, done it, been there, got the T-shirt. It's a funny old life, isn't it? When I look back, what would I have changed, if anything? And Oh, I should have done this, I shouldn't have done that. It's strange. It's strange as you get older. Someone said to me a little while ago, do you, do you think about dying You know, as, as you're really old now? <laughs> really old. I won't say who this was, but this was a younger person. You know, do you think about dying all the time? No, I don't. I don't. I've got a lot to do. I've had to do some... We've had a new door. Uh, our porch door's been replaced with a new double-glazed unit. I've got to cement... The, well, I've done that. I've cemented the floor and I've put the paint on, which is damp-proof stuff, because the house is coming up to 200 years old. Sorry, 100. 200? A, I'm going senile. So all the youngsters, you'll be saying, yeah, see, see, you are balmy, you're mad. 100 years old. Then I've got to put the uh, the flooring down. We used to call it lino. Who remembers lino? It's now vinyl flooring, isn't it? Well, I don't know what it's called now. Vinyl, vino lay, vinyl flooring. Yeah, I, I can't die. I've got too many jobs to do. I've got more podcasts to do. I can't die. 
But no, I don't keep thinking of dying. I do know one person older than me. He quite often says, oh, when I'm gone, this will happen. You know, when I'm gone, I don't know about this. Oh, when I've gone. And I have said to him, you know, I wish you wouldn't keep on about when you've gone. You know, if you're going to keep on about it, then just go and leave us all in peace rather than rant on about it all the time. No, I don't think older people do think of dying all the time. Mind you, I'm 70. Uh, OK, so how many years have I got? This same person said that the other to me <laughs> the other day. How many years do you think you've got? Well, 30. I could live to 100. I could have another 30 years. Stone the crows, imagine. <laughs> what would I look like then? Can you imagine? Th oh, no. I don't know. It's funny. It's a good job because the same person, I can't mention who it was, the same person said, do you think you'd like to know the day that you die, you know, be given a date or on the so-and-so month or whatever year, that's it. No, I, I wouldn't. That would be awful, wouldn't it? In fact, this is an awful subject. I don't know. Who brought this up? Go on, own up. Who mentioned this and who kicked me off on this one? Actually, that's just reminded me. I had an email months ago back in the summer. Someone said, why don't you do a podcast episode on the afterlife? Afterlife? Well, I don't know anything about the afterlife. Is there something beyond the grave <laughs> I don't, I'd have to make it up well if there is I want free beer and fish and chips <laughs> free beer and fish and chips beer beans and bread that's what you need that's all you need to survive on oh I see the uh, toilet roll thing kicked off the other day I read something on Twitter you're all thinking now how come you keep looking on Twitter that's where I get my news from because all these news channels, they all seem to be biased one way or the other. None of them just talk about the news anymore. They're all biased. If you go on to Twitter, OK, there's a load of rubbish there, obviously, loads of rubbish. But what I do is kind of evaluate the whole lot, take a bit from this uh, post and a bit from that post, put it together, and you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on. You can kind of get a, a balance, I suppose, is the way to put it. Twitter is pretty good, actually, for news. The other day, I heard a load of sirens downtown here, loads of police sirens, helicopter as well. Went on to Twitter. I just typed in hometown and uh, well, it typed in Worthing and police, something like that. Someone's put on there what was going on. I think someone had driven through a shop window in their car by accident, <laughs> driven through a shop window. So, yeah, it's, it's a good thing for local news as well as worldwide news. Anyway, why am I waffling on about Twitter? Have you had enough now? I think it's about three quarters. No, it's more than three quarters of an hour. I think you've had enough, haven't you? OK, let's end it here. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Let's have your emails, especially more twins. I, like, I, I don't know why that idea sort of grabbed me. Twins and their stories. Uh, good or bad, and twins' fingerprints, are they the same? Must be a lot of twins out there listening to this. Are your fingerprints the same? <laughs> I'd love to know. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Take care. What's happening with lockdown? I forget, we've had Boris back in the week, didn't we? What did Boris say? Well, I can't remember now. Oh, COVID, uh, pa uh, passports, what are they called? No, not the passport to go abroad. Um, oh, I don't know, something passport you need to go into certain venues like nightclubs. Well, that's me. I'm not going to nightclubs anyway. Imagine me going to a nightclub or those teenage girls. Oh, no, don't. Good. I'd get arrested. No, no, no. You need COVID pass, isn't it? COVID passport to say you've been jabbed or pricked or whatever it is they do with you. Pricked. Good grief. I think it's time to end it before I get arrested. Thanks for listening. It's been great talking to you all. You know how much I love it. I really do enjoy it. <laughs> talking rubbish for an hour, but well, it's not quite an hour. It's brilliant, isn't it? I just wish I got paid for it. Imagine getting paid for this. I mean, imagine some radio station saying, come and talk rubbish for an hour on our, our radio station and paying me perhaps five grand to go. That'd be right, dear. What do you do for a living? I talk rubbish for an hour a week and I get five grand a week. <laughs> anyway, any radio station managers out there, I am available for hire. <laughs> uh, I'd probably have to pay them. Defeats the object. Now, listen, you lot, take care. Look after yourselves. Don't go and catch COVID or anything. Be sensible. And uh, do I say happy Christmas yet? What's the date? I don't know where we are. 
Um, yeah, happy Christmas. I'll say happy Christmas anyway and happy new year. But I'm sure I'll be talking to you before the actual day itself. OK, that's it. Bye bye for now.